Okay, well, I am honored to be here with a friend of mine, uh, Linda McIntyre. Did I say your name right? Yes. I think it's the easy one. Yes. Okay. Easier than Leo Babauta. <laughs> but uh, Linda is someone who I've known for a little while, and we've done some work together in, I think, first in Fearless Training Program uh, a few years ago, and then you came into Fearless Mastery. And it's been a huge honor to have you in our programs because I think you're doing such an amazing, amazing work. Uh, the first thing that I learned about you in terms of the work that you're doing in the world is that you um, were leading, I think you're still leading the uh, Parkinson's choir um, where you are in Australia. Uh, am I, am I getting that right? Yes. Okay. And you're, so you're still um, leading that, is that yes, right? Yes, the new, vo new Voice Choir in Brisbane. New Voice Choir. Uh, and that's basically all people with Parkies, is that right? No, no, it's uh, people oh. with Parkinson's and their supporters. And our byline is actually celebrating people with Parkinson's and their supporters. So we, uh. um, yeah, the majority of us have Parkinson's. I have Parkinson's. Possibly the only qualified, experienced choral director in the world with Parkinson's running a Parkinson's choir, possibly. I'd love to know of any wow. others. But um, sure. But we have people in there who are partners. Um, we have a couple of uh, professional caregivers who bring their clients along and actually sit in the background and dance, <laughs> dance along with us. <laughs> um, yeah, oh, we have amazing. people. I have a dear friend in there who's a retired uh, a retired um, uh, physio, uh, rehab mm -hmm. physio, um, who was very interested in, in choral singing. And uh, when she retired from her job, she joined us. So, yeah. Yeah, amazing. And I'm going to ask you more questions about this, but that's the first exposure that I had. And we're going to share links to uh, New Voices uh, so that people can check no, it out. No, New Voice. The video. New, oi, oi, oi. new Voice. Yeah. Okay. Okay, my bad. Thanks for correcting me. But so we'll share um, links to like, you know, where to see more on New Voice. But the video that I saw, the first one I saw, I was just blown away. And it was really moving. And just, just incredible to see just such great things coming out of what you're doing. Um, so we'll talk more about that. But that isn't all of who you are. Um, I, you are also uh, an experienced um, an amazing composer, and um, you're doing some work now that I'll ask you. Maybe you can explain a little bit about the work you're doing um, with the studies that you're doing. Mm. Now? Yeah, oh. yeah. if you can. Can you, can you explain sure. a little bit about that? Um, I'm doing a PhD at the University of Queensland mm -hmm. in the School of Music, um, and it's ostensibly as a new music uh, composer and uh, writing on the narrative of lived trauma. Um, but mm. I added to that, that wasn't enough. <laughs> so I, <laughs> I added to that with what we think is a world first study. Um, it's a case mm. study of myself supposedly watching Parkinson's destroy my musical soul over a period of years mm. and documenting it because no one's done that before as far as we can see and why would they? Um, the musical soul being the deepest, deepest level of my mathematical creativity. Um, hmm. so, uh, so that case study is turning up things it wasn't expected to turn up because when I go into long periods of this deep, deep composing, it's flinging back onto the Parkinson's and hmm. fixing physical symptoms and, you know, that, you, you could understand maybe it would fix with some cognitive symptoms or some, uh, you know, some psychological symptoms, mm -hmm. but it fixes physical symptoms that I'm not using at the time. It, it's quite fascinating. Okay. So hopefully anyone listening or watching can understand why I invited you here to talk about <laughs> creativity and love and you are embodying that kind of work um and you even sent me a message i think it was yesterday about composing that i want to dig into because it was fascinating um and so there's a lot here to dig into um and um 
I there's another aspect of you as a composer that you shared with me about how you experience music that I thought would be really fascinating to dig into as well. Can you just give us a brief glimpse into what I'm talking about? I'm not quite sure. Do you mean the three the oh. three D aspect? Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I never. I didn't. I know that it it probably exists very rarely in the world, but I, you're the only one I've ever met. Mm. Um, like this. Well, so t- yeah, tell us a little bit. Well, what, about I do that. have a rather extraordinary oral gift. That's the fact. And so yeah, a lot of people wouldn't experience this even you know, fine, very fine composers. So when I create, the best way I can say is that I'm inside the music. Um, now, you get people who experience music in colour, for example. It's, it's mm. uncommon, but it does happen. So I do that a little bit. I experience it more in texture. Everything has texture. I can touch it. And when I'm mm. inside a piece like now, because I just happen to be right at the start of a new piece, which is not even the start of a section, it's a whole piece. And we're not talking about a piece that I'd knock over in a week. You know, this is a piece I'll work on for months and a big, something big. And there's, I work patchwork. I like to work patchwork. When I feel really good about composing, there's a chunk here and a chunk there and a chunk there and a chunk there and someone else mightn't be able to see how they relate but I can see mm. how they're going to pull together over time. And it's just an instinctive thing. I don't deliberately do this. And so now I'm sort of almost going into this space now. I can see it. There's bits of this piece there. You can see the little bit there. <laughs> There's oh, bits wow. of it all over the joint. And then when I get to the point, because I spend a lot of time with it just working in my head, and then when I start actually getting it down, and that's a bit of a problem, you, you can go too far with it in your head and not start. But then if you go and start getting it down too early, I feel that sells the music short. I need to have time to, mm. to make more of this. And then I can pull these bits down. Right, that one's got to go here. And, oh, hang on, I need that bit there. And I'm going to pop that in here. Oh, wow. And I patchwork all the way through. The whole thing and then it wow. and the the more at one I feel with the music I'm writing, the more that happens. If it doesn't happen mm. much, then I'm writing at a much lighter level. I could be writing for my choir, I could be doing a big arrangement in five part harmony that I know is really, really well written. Um uh vocal oh, wow. music, uh big orchestral uh backing tracks that um are just done digitally. Um you know, that's there's a lot of there's a lot of knowledge and craft as well as art that goes into that. Mm. But I don't have to do this patchwork thing and go down into the depths of my creativity to do that. I can just do that because I know how to and I'm good at it. But that's a completely separate issue to this what I call the big composer. Amazing to hear about this. Thanks thanks for sharing a bit about that. I'm curious, I want to just ask a couple of questions about this. So have you always experienced music like this, even when you were young? Or do you remember when you first either like experienced it this way or realized that it was different than others? Uh, No, because I took it, (laughs) I can remember when I was about 16 or something talking to someone, I didn't get brought up in a classical music family. um, So I wasn't surrounded by that sort of, uh, uh, academia in music, if you like, like a lot of people mm-hmm. are who grow up in, into this. Um, and I remember talking to someone about the, just the perfect pitch um, and, you know, I could do blah, 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 blah. And I was telling this guy who went on to be an orchestral cellist um, who was at my mm. school with me and he said, have you got perfect pitch? And I said, what? Mm. What's that? And he said, oh, you know, la, 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 la. I said, well, I could also boom, 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 boom. And he said, well, can you, huh? And I said, well, (laughs) can't you? And he said, no. Mm. And I said, I thought everyone could do this. Who was a music? I just did. I didn't know it was different. No one told me it was different. (laughs) Wow. And But I I think I mean the 3D Uh, aspect of it. Did you? Yeah, did you always experience music that way or I think um, so. 
I think so. Mm-hmm. It was just because it's just part of me. So it's just even when you like listen to the radio or or a CD or something like that, it, is that how you experience music? Well, I'm not sure, but when I was nine months old, and back in those days, you used to get put out in a bassinet in bassinet in the yard to sun yourself, and there was always a story okay. that Mum, who wasn't a musician, used to say that uh, she had me out under the old willow tree at home, um, and she told Dad to go out and check check on me, um, and he came back white as a sheet. She was doing the washing, I mm. remember. She always said, and he came back white as a sheet and she thought something terrible had happened. And he used to play, he wasn't a musician either, and he just played the radio in the house. And way back then, I believe, Under the Bridges of Paris was a hit song. And okay. um, and apparently he came back and said, she's humming Under the Bridges of Paris when I was nine oh months gosh. old. So, oh, my God. So that's when they triggered that. It triggered their thinking that maybe something needs to be done about this when she's a bit older. <laughs> but yeah, I think I think these wacky and weird these wacky and weird um, symptoms, if you like, of mm. of this uh, music gift. I think they've been going on forever, probably. Amazing. So I, I would love to look at that 3d aspect but also just how you um start composing because since you're at the beginning of a composition right now uh, before we move into parkinson's and and how it affected your um your musical gift and abilities over time so i'd I'd like to look at that but let's start with um composing so i'm really curious because there's going to be other people here who our creators, whether it's music or visual arts, and we start out facing, you know, a blank canvas or a blank page. And I would really love to know, like, what that process is like for you when you get started with a composition. Hmm. Um, and I know you've you've just started recently, so that's we're, we've caught you at a really good time. You have, and it's unusual too, because normally mm. when I compose a piece, right, mm-hmm. it'll I like writing programmatically. That means telling a story. Um, it, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's, you know, the story starts here, it does that and it finishes here. It might be my interpretation of something I've experienced and just putting that into music, right? But when mm-hmm. I start something, I've already just, I know what I'm going to write. I have an idea about it and the thinking... Okay for the design of the piece and the what I'm trying to say and the dots, if you like, that start to form in my head. It all comes in at once. But this mm. piece, because I decided to do, I, I, was, I was in the middle of this symphony and I've been getting a bit stale with a few things going on in life and I thought, I'm just going to set that aside and do something to freshen up. So this new piece has come about first. It's a string quintet. And I, here I am, I've decided I'm going to do a string quintet, but I don't know what I'm going to write about. Now, that's unusual for me. I don't normally do that. Mm. So, and then an idea was given to me by another composer, which I just think is so exciting. So, uh, so I didn't have any dots forming because if mm. I was going to write about this thing that I had to make somehow match this narrative of lived trauma, which is part of the PhD, what -hmm. part of my life can I dredge up and write about for this that I'm not already going to dredge up and write about in the symphony and the opera that's coming after it? I had to think of something else. So he came up with this idea that I've been going through right now with a Parkinson's symptom. And and then I, uh, well, where do I start now? Because it's not all forming Mm. for me already because I didn't come up with the idea. You see, I see. And so I, I normally would create the idea, the whole thing. And so what shall I do? Shall I write about what that symptom does to me, how it makes me feel and how I'm dealing with it? Shall I write about the mm. symptom itself as if I am the symptom? Um, yeah. mm. What am I going to do? <laughs> and I've, right. I've ended up deciding it might be a bit of all these things combined. And, and I've okay. also decided, don't worry about that. Let's just... You know, find a starting point. Well, that's that's a that's very important. 
I could I could spend a month of Sundays worrying about that to be the perfectionist okay. that I am. Um, and, okay. and uh, it's going to hold me up. So I'm just going to start mm. somewhere. And so that's when the patchworks started to form. But something that's mm. really important with anyone starting out with a piece or whatever, I, I think, is get yourself in conversation with someone that fires you up, um, someone okay. like, like this uh, principal advisor of mine at UQ who is a, a renowned composer and double bassist, and he was the one that actually oh, wow. came up with this idea. We get on Zooms, you know, for an hour or so, and we, we can start out with a very uh, boring conversation about something to do with an administrative matter or you know, writing, okay. writing literary reviews um, or something that it has to be done. And we can, we can start out like that. And the next thing, we're on to the guts of something to do with composing. We might talk about another person okay. and then we, we fire onto our own stuff. And then he's talking about his and I'm talking about mine. And we bounce back and forth. Amazing. And he sends me through the roof with excitement. And I get off that. Oh, wow. I get off those calls. The other day, I got off that call, and I couldn't wipe the silly grin off my face for an hour, because <laughs> that's what he does. That's so good. Yeah. So I would mm. highly recommend that people find someone who is interested in that same sort of creativity, and just have a conversation mm. and see where it takes them. Because you know, Rob doesn't need me to fire him up as a composer. He does perfectly adequately without me, but I'd just about be sure that I fire him up too because mm. the, the conversations just flow and then I get off that I, call yeah. and I can't wait to get into it and then the ideas start popping. Mm. Like on the call or afterward or both? For which? Uh, for the ideas, are they popping like on the call with him no, uh, or is it like well, after the call? If we were specifically talking about a piece I was in the middle of and I said, hey, Rob, tell me about this. What do you reckon about this? Or how can you get your double bass and just show me something? Um, uh, you know, uh -huh. that would be a different matter. Uh, but, yeah, it's afterwards when I'm in my own head, in my own space, and there it is. And do you find it important? I love this, by the way. This is this is amazing. So, do you find it important after a call like that, when you've got all these ideas popping, to like sit down and start composing and like clear everything away? Like, is is it important to capture that? No. Magic? Now that's really interesting okay. point because of the Parkinson's. Okay, so mm. the Parkinson's has it's got its nasty little bits into all of. All of me, all of my thinking. This is the part, this is why I'm doing this case study because the cognitive side of Parkinson's terrifies me way more than having mm. a tremor or, or anything. You know, we all have our different symptoms. There are dozens upon dozens upon dozens of symptoms. The fact you can't see okay. me with big tremors or whatever, I have had tremors, but then you up the drugs and they quash the symptoms a bit, you know. Um, so we have so many symptoms, and people say, You don't look like you've got Parkinson's but they don't know what's going on inside. Oh, wow. um, and so right. this cognitive issue, um, it, it's, it's got into everything. It's got into my thinking, my psychology, you know, my, uh, the psychology can trigger mental health issues at times, you know, and then I deal with them and I mm. move on. But it can't get its nasty little claws into this gift. And mm. this just amazes me that it's I, – I see, I see silly pictures in my head for everything and I see a cylinder. I don't know why, but it's a cylinder with concrete and steel reinforcing mesh around it and inside is this gift with this particular mm. part of my memory. I forget everything else, right, but this particular part okay. of my memory. And somehow Parkinson's hasn't. Yet, not saying it won't, it hasn't got through that steel reinforcing mesh and that concrete. And so if I, that's, so that's why I'm saying all these things, you know, I make all this patchwork. This can go on for weeks before I start writing. Um, and okay. But in a big piece, I'm talking about only in a big, great big piece, um, 
as long as it's continuing to go or I know I need to start getting it down. But I don't lose those bits. They just get bigger and bigger. Oh, and three-dimensional. See, that's the thing. This three-dimensional sound on every side and I'm inside it. Um, it's, It's when it happens, when it's happening, it feels amazing. Mm-hmm. And it feels mm. so exciting. How would you describe it? Like you said, it feels amazing. Is it like riding a roller coaster uh-uh. or like falling in love or seeing a sunset? All of the above? No. Um, I, I've never <laughs> ridden a roller coaster. I have no intention of ever doing so. Um, okay. <laughs> it's, um, it's just, it's all encompassing, but in a completely positive way. Um, mm. and the, the thing is, do I fight it sometimes because it's all over the joint or do I just lose myself in it? And, mm. uh, I think what's well, pretty obvious, which way is the best way to go, but <laughs> it's difficult to describe because it's just me. Um, I'd love, yeah. I'd love to have someone put an uh, fMRI, a functional MRI on me while this is going on. I would love to hmm. see what's going on in my head, especially when I've got uh, I would love to see that too. Yeah. I think that could be a great uh, virtual reality experience. Let's get inside of Linda's head. <laughs> we could. A big VR. We could make money out of this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So you mentioned getting lost in it. And I love, I love that phrase of just really losing yourself in the work that you're doing. Yes, but um, and I, there's a problem. Yeah, okay, go ahead. Because yeah, okay. you have to routine, make routines and things for your week, right, if you're going to hit your goals and that sort mm-hmm. of thing, and never more so when you have Parkinson's because it wallops your uh, executive thinking. You might think you're the okay. best list maker in the world. I am, but I'm the queen of lists. <laughs> but when it comes to actually making them happen, getting from that point to mm-hmm. that point to that point, Parkinson's batters that really badly, really badly, and it will continue to do so. Mm. So if you do lock yourself into schedules and routines, which is so important moving day to day Mm -hmm. in Parkinson's, ultra important, Um, if you do that, you lose these big open-ended sessions where you can get lost. Um, Mm. So that's why... I do the old trick that so many people do with planning of cramming things into days, you know, that days for okay. all those sorts of things. And I have to do this with the PhD more and more. I need to set aside days for writing, as in, you know, literature reviews and stuff like that. Okay. Um, and I need the fun stuff. Yeah, that, that stuff. <laughs> and, and also the case study, getting that down. And I need to set aside okay. just clear a couple of days a week, even just two days a week that are cleared and I can do, I can just start composing. And if I want to keep going for nine hours, I can. Mm -hmm. If I want to go for two hours, you know, if that's all I can do. So the whole day is clear. Is that what I'm hearing? It's like open and the whole, like leave your calendar. Yeah. And Mm -hmm. that means putting boundaries in place and that boundaries are hard enough to put in place for yourself you know, because I have a tendency to write a million to-do lists and they're, they're all important. Mm-hmm. Just, you know, they've got to be pissed off. And um, But the other thing <laughs> is create boundaries for other people. Mm. And Like what, what do you do to, to create those boundaries? For the other people? Um, mm-hmm. Well, if they're, if they're friends and they respect what you're doing, it's usually not, not such an issue because even though they might need a reminder now and then, they get it. Um, and you just tell them like Tuesday is my day for, for creating and like, don't bother me on Tuesdays yes, or something like that. In a nicer way. Yeah. Um, and, yeah. but they, they absolutely understand it. In fact, they'd encourage it, um, because mm. they're that sort of people. Um, the, uh, others, others don't mm-hmm. get it so much. And I live out in the bush yeah. Um, I can put a padlock around the gate. That is something that I do. 
um, okay. padlock the gate so people don't just decide they can wander in here without letting me know. Uh, I love that. Yeah. And um, it's, yeah, turn the phone off. Turn the phone to do not disturb and then don't look at it. Don't look. <laughs> and I don't allow things like, uh, I don't allow things like uh, emails, which are nonstop all day, stupid emails. Um, we we have so much more problem with mail since we went on to mm. digital mail as opposed to a letterbox at the end of your driveway. Um, mm. People, under, people understood before that you'd only get your mail once a day, right? Right. They don't expect you to, like, reply right away. Yeah. And so, yeah. Um, but since I've been at UQ, I get that a bit better because academics never reply straight away. And okay. <laughs> they set it aside to one time a day. And I think this is what mm. I need to do. So, yeah, putting boundaries in place for everybody else, I, I constantly struggle with that. Well, I, I appreciate you talking about this because, you, as you said, Parkinson's gives, makes it extra challenging. Like, take what we normally face and multiply by a thousand or something like that. Mm -hmm. But there's still things that all of us have to face, right? There, those kinds of interruptions and scheduling and blocking off this uninterrupted time and setting boundaries. So if it's working for you, someone with these extra challenges, then I think that's, a, that's instructive for the rest of us as well. Well, so I, I have really a, um, a, a philosophy that anything that's good for mm -hmm. Parkinson's is good for mm -hmm. everybody. I might, yeah. I might need it more, I love that. but, you know, in certain, certain areas I might need something more. Um, it might be a more pressing need, but pretty much right across the board, if it's good for Parkinson's, it's good for everyone. Yeah. And, you know, that's so interesting because I actually believe that is true, not only of like neurodegenerative diseases, but also people who are neuroatypical. You know, they don't, yes. you know, people with autism spectrum disorder or ADHD, bipolar, they are facing extra challenges, but they're, this, they're actually the same challenges as the rest of us, mm -hmm. just multiplied by a lot more. And so whatever applies to them, like, you know, that helps us as well, just people mm -hmm. who are not faced with the same degree of challenge, but with similar challenges. Yes, totally. Yeah. Okay. So block off your day, set boundaries, and just give yourself this open space to lose yourself. And is it besides not checking your phone and all of that kind of stuff, is there anything else that helps you to actually lose yourself in it? Um... No, just 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 the knowledge that mm. I can that is mm. enormous. If I if okay. I know I have to stop at a certain time um because uh because I have an appointment online or because you know uh, mm. someone's uh some business needs to get in touch with me or a tradie needs to come in to fix something knowing that quite often means I can't dive into that deepest area uh, hmm. because I there see. is an enormous level of freedom involved if I know I can just get right down there, get down and dirty and go into a virtually a trance-like state. Hmm. Is it hard to come out of the translate like state? Like once you're in it and you've, you're creating and then you're like, okay, it's time to go do something else. Is it hard for you to leave it? Uh, Are you afraid you might lose something? No, no. If I'm having a really good long day, I would, the last, the very mm -hmm. last job I would do um, is I would get a pencil or a piece of paper or, or I'd type it in if I'm putting uh notes into the computer at that point, because I usually work by hand with a pencil and manuscript, um, and okay. I will jot down, don't forget, this is where you're up to. You've got to come straight back to this. Mm. And that's the just that's, that's nitty-gritty stuff. Um, but yeah, yeah. Uh, it just really that's just my, uh, that's your admin side, if you like, of, of writing the piece. No, that's really good. Um, and I'd certainly do that yeah. for writing words, like, lit reviews and stuff, but, but in the music I would do the same thing. Just a few, a few zapped words in and I know exactly what I want to come back to to start with because I might have a problem there and I want to fix, I want to, I talk to myself 
quite a bit if I have a problem, you know. And I, oh, yeah, and it's just, I've always done this when I'm writing. Um, oh, mm-hmm. oh, don't do that. Oh, uh, no, that's <laughs> stupid. Oh, no, it's not. No, it, no, you might make. Oh, oh, you need to sleep on that. Oh, let's move on to some. Uh, so these are just little silly conversations. Um, but sure. But, Generally speaking, when I'm deep into it, I don't move. I barely move apart from a mm. pencil on a piece of paper. I have noticed my eyes move constantly when I'm in that trance-like state because I can feel it. Mm. I'd, and they mo- I don't know what that's about. If there's any neuroscientists out there who know, I'd love to know because everything okay. else is as still as could be. And um, But in terms of coming out of it, when I'm really, really into it, at my last house I had a big set of internal stairs to get up to the kitchen from the study and mm-hmm. I noticed when I was really deeply into it, I could actually leave that study, walk up the stairs into the kitchen, go and get some water or what, go to the loo, whatever it was I needed to do and um, preferably not go to the loo in the kitchen but then, <laughs> and then come back down the stairs and go straight back to work and not leave really? that state. You're still like in the trance. You're still lost in And it. yet I'm perfectly, obviously, being careful walking on stairs with Parkinson's. Really? I am absolutely fine to do that and do what I have to do, but I, I don't leave that state. So that's... Interesting. Yeah, it is. Um, uh, other than that, if I have a really... A good thing to do if I want a, a long day is start very early, of course, and mm. and then just keep going as I see fit. Um, and if I do have a nice long day, I do, though, try to call it quits at about 5.30 because mm. if I don't, it keeps me so fired up I can't wind down for sleep. And I'll just keep... And sleep is important. I'll just keep working all night. For you, for this. Yeah. Okay. So I need to stop. There's a lot I want to keep asking you about here, um, but I also want to get to some of the things on your Parkinson's journey as it relates to composing and music. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about the choir as well and about Fearless Mastery. So I'm going to ask you one last question about composing before we move on to these other topics. Uh, So um, you mentioned... What was it in your voice note to me? It was, I think it was something about driving and composing. And, um, and so I, at the same time, and there was this, this image that I have in my head. So I'd love for you to share a little bit more about the experience or two that you've had recently. That about was composing. pretty amazing. So it's only a couple of days ago, we had a choir day and I have to drive to Brisbane, um, which is quite a drive mm-hmm. from where I'm living now. I'm concentrating on the okay. traffic. I was. I really genuinely was. There are people will hear this and say, no, you weren't, but I was. And I had the classical okay. radio station on and it happened to be playing uh, Vaughan Williams' uh, The Lark Ascending, the orchestral version, which is just glorious. Um, so if anyone hasn't okay. listened to it, listen to it. And I haven't. It's yeah. glorious. Okay, thank you. And, uh, mm-hmm. and it was on in the radio and because of this oral gift, when I listen to music, notes, I, I see score. I, I see the music okay. and whatnot. And, but I was doing that and driving along and because I'm at that, right at that start of this piece of music where I'm so excited, I think, and the, the patchworks are forming, I suddenly realised mm. I was also inside the main piece of patchwork that's there and working on it at the same time while I was driving along you, the, listening you're to composing. Vaughan Williams, the notes, yes, at the same time, and, and I was definitely they- concentrating I'm so I'm trying to visualize. Are they in the same space and like interfering with each other or blending together your composition and this other piece you're listening to? Or no. how does that work? And there's like there's a lot of strings, right, in the Vaughan Williams piece, and this is a string quintet. Okay. But I wasn't even thinking about strings. In I'm just looking at notes okay. and things like that, and rhythms, and and textures and shapes, which is what I look at all the time in these blobs, and. And I was right inside one of those blobs of that I'm working on, but at the same time okay. I'm concentrating on there is no commonality, this glorious, soaring Vaughan Williams piece and this quite jagged music that I'm creating for this, these particular blobs. There's no commonality whatsoever. 
So I wasn't being influenced by this. These blobs aren't going to end up sounding like Vaughan Williams. I can assure you of that. It, and when I afterwards, I when I realised what I was doing, I thought this is freaky. This is amazing. Um, I have been called a freak on many occasions. Don't worry. But, but I this, believe <laughs> one one leading composer in Australia once referred to what I have as that affliction. So. Oh, I was wow. so offended, but I, I've got older. I think it's funny. I, I just that, think yeah. it's funny now. But, um, <laughs> um, you know, yeah, yeah, you couldn't do it. Um, so <laughs> so I, was, I was really blown away that I was doing this. And then afterwards I thought, Could I, have I done this before? I must have. Can I do it again? I don't know if I want to when mm. I'm driving. Um, I, I, it was really freaky and it's got something to do with, I'm just surmising, but I'm pretty sure, got something to do with the fact that I'm right at that start of that piece of music and I'm so excited mm. by it and so deeply into these bits that I could. Oh, um, uh, so obviously I wasn't in a trance-like state because I couldn't drive. But sure. I was still right inside the craft of that blob. And, like, that's composing for you. When you're saying you're inside the craft of that blob, you're actually composing in, in, a, in a sense, right? Yeah, because... I couldn't paint my way out of a paper bag, right? But I wish I could because these blobs, they're not static and they're not even music going from left to right. They're shapes mm -hmm. and colours and textures and they move. In th Each blob moves three-dimensionally. And so mm. what I have to do then is take this incredible moving blob and transcribe that into music which is not necessarily wow. an easy thing because some of my blobs are very complex. Oh, really? Uh, so, so fascinating. I, I can spend forever on this, but like I said, there's a, a few other topics that I want to touch sure. on. Um, so I'm curious if you could just, you know, it doesn't have to be a really in-depth share, but just briefly share a little bit about your journey with how Parkinson's has been affecting your musical abilities and and everything like that, and then, as you've alluded to, how it went the other way, where your music is actually affecting the Parkinson's. Mm. Could you could you summarize that for us? Uh, uh, you know, I know you're writing a whole PhD on this, but uh, it, the the short version. Uh, well, well, it is obviously affecting me physically um, as, as mm -hmm. a player. Um, it has very practically speaking, because um, when I before I knew I had Parkies, I used to fall a lot and do some real, real damage to myself. And at one point, uh, some uh, some scarring that formed inside here meant that had to be mm. cut. And so I can't, I can't lift this finger like I should be able to. And so it's affected my piano playing. But then I've adapted to how okay. to get around that. So that's very practical. Okay. Um, okay. The uh, like, like many people with Parkinson's, when you walk. To your instrument and start playing, a lot of the symptoms will go. Um, the okay. uh, that's that's very common. Uh, people with big tremors and things like that. Um, when when I stand up in front of a choir and conduct, because I'm mm -hmm. the, there's a lot of heavy thinking because you're you know and, and sing from this part to this part to this part and you're conducting at the same time. That's massive cognitive workload. And you're on your feet, which engages several billion more brain uh, neurons, I believe, because you're up on your feet. It's like the Parkinson's just goes whoosh, gone. And really, yeah, it's um, oh wow, it, it, that's a magical thing. It's like someone's just increased the you've just increased your drug level or something, and it's just you know, bang. Um, is that just for you, or is that for everybody who does this kind of thing? I don't know. Who has Parkinson's? Oh, you mean the, who, okay. who conduct? I, well, I don't know that there's a great there there oh, aren't many of us I thought, who do. Uh, okay. <laughs> well, I, I actually thought you meant anyone who's like engaging with music at all, like whether oh. they're playing an instrument or conducting. Uh, well, I don't so, see but it, yeah. Running a choir and conducting the the cognitive there's a, a special particular type of cognitive workload and you're on your feet and I tend to start dancing around on my feet even at a time oh, cool. when Back when my balance was so bad a few years ago, I could have just fallen over. And mm. um, uh, so that's, that's uh, yeah, music, there's so many studies being done 
on how music uh, helps with Parkinson's symptoms, but we're talking about mm. uh, particularly psychological uh, symptoms the, the, and having community that we have formed in quiet, that's massive. Mm. Um, it lifts people up who are doing the music. Um, but what it does for me is like therapy. Is it, well, it is for wow. them too because, and I'm working specifically sure. on their voices because people lose their voices with Parkinson's. So I'm working on their pitch and their dynamics and all this and their timing and it makes oh, wow. a big difference. But it gives me a therapeutic dose in a whole different way when I'm out the front. Wow. Well, we, we, maybe someday there'll be a prescription for anyone who has Parkinson's to be actually conducting a choir because <laughs> if it's so therapeutic. I think that's, um, I actually do teach that sometimes in, in therapy. I teach people to do basic conducting because it engages that extra. Oh, wow. And I force my choir to read score. Even if they've never read a note of music in their lives, they can learn to really? follow the shapes and there are dynamics in there, the loudness and the softness, and there are a line of lyrics under the notes. It's complicated oh, because I'm targeting the cognition. Wow. Amazing. But, and but so Leo, it, it sounds like part of, okay, they, yes, go ahead. The, the funny thing is they keep coming back. So, <laughs> so it, it can't be too bad. <laughs> Even though you're, <laughs> you're challenging them in these yeah. ways. All right. So it sounds like part of your um, research is not only documenting what your journey has been, how you've been affected by Parkinson's and your musical um, journey has been affected by Parkinson's, but also this very thing of how Parkinson's is affected by this kind of therapy, as you called no, it. No, not really, because I okay. can't fit that into my PhD as well. So, okay. <laughs> but a lot of people have okay. already done a lot of documentation, not so much about a conductor, but people who partake in musical activity and creativity. Um, but my thing that's weird and wacky is that I discovered when I went into really, really long hours of tr that trance-like state, and I did that because I was miss I was going to miss a, a major deadline for a piece years ago. Um, okay. uh, I thought I'd just be able to compose at my normal old-fashioned pace. Well, I found that I can't. Parkinson's has slowed mm. me right down in in the um, the amount of composing I can spew out, you know, in in certain amounts of time. And I was horrified. Okay. And so I just kept pushing it and pushing because I'm pretty pig-headed when I want to be. And I was pushing it. And in the end, I was working 15, 18-hour days straight and staying in trance, though, almost the whole time. Wow. But it took me weeks to build that up. And I saw these magical things happen. I saw my balance go from pretty woeful to pretty perfect. I saw my oh, wow. stepping increase my length of step. I saw my arm swinging increase. All these basic physical things that Parkinson's does, nasty things to you, they just vanished. And yet I was sitting on oh my, my ass the whole time, barely <laughs> moving for all that time. Mm -hmm. No physical exercise whatsoever. That's just intriguing. Wow. Just intriguing. It really is. Ah, oh, fascinating. I, I love I love that you are doing your PhD on this. This is probably something that you know no one's ever done any research on. Uh, I can't imagine that anyone else is working on this. So it's it's fascinating and it sounds like important work. Yeah, it uh, one one neuroscientist uh, who heard about this way back said that's really interesting. It could open up a whole new area of Parkinson's research. Wow. Ah. Uh. And like you said, if it if it helps with Parkinson's, the rest of us probably could benefit from it as well. Yeah, I mean, we're not all going um, to jump in and be composers writing orchestral music and stuff, but it's not sure. about that. It's about what right. part of the brain, what's it doing to the brain that this sort of work, what could someone else do to create the same effects? Yeah. Okay, here's my question. You you kind of in passing mentioned it took a while to build that up, which which you know you spent weeks in this trance like state because you had this deadline, you know, 15, 18 hours a day. But it you said it it took a while to build that up. Tell me about that process because I think there's a lot of us yep. who would like to build that up. When I started yeah, go ahead. thinking I could just drop straight into that. Oh yeah, right. <laughs> 
two minutes, Leo, is all I could drop into that space for. And the peripheral composing, which is all part of it too, it is slightly, you know, not, not as deep as that, mm-hmm. half an hour around it, I was horrified. Mm. I was absolutely horrified what really? Parkinson's had done to me. And that's when I thought, yeah, I, I tried it again the next day. I thought, am I just off? Tried it again the next day. Two minutes, same thing. I was so devastated. I thought, wow. can I not compose anymore? Because I'd had a bit of a hiatus from it. Can I just not, do I have to give up all my dreams? Mm. What, going back to this PhD? Can I not do this? And so I thought, well, you're not getting to get me that, that easily. I'm going to have a crack at this. And so I did it just for a few more days. It's really devastating thing. And then there was another minute and another half hour of the mm. peripheral stuff. And I thought, uh, uh, uh. So I'm going to try this again. Just another day. I tried it again and I got another minute. And then there was an extra wow. five minutes. And then there was an extra half an hour. And little oh, so by really little, oh, up. little, and I thought, right, I've got you now, Parkies. <laughs> and, I, and that's when my, my heels dug in. And you've never seen Linda when mm. she's got her heels dug in. Don't get in my way. And, yeah. and it, doesn't, it doesn't matter how bad I know, generally speaking, this is for me. I just, that deadline, I, it was either admit failure I can't compose. I can't comp- uh, compose anymore, or have a damn good crack at it because I don't want to go down that line. And and then little by little, each once I saw this first twinkle, each day or each two days, it just stretched that little tiny weeny bit, and it went from those miniature Amazing. pieces. And I hit about three weeks, and it went, woof, and I ended up with about. Oh, you know, about four or five hours of trance and a couple of hours of the roundabout state. And I thought, All right now we're cooking. But I was so far <laughs> behind the eight ball by then, behind the eight ball, I just pushed it and pushed it and pushed it. And then it just wow. stretched and stretched and stretched. And then the physical stuff started changing when I had just been sitting on my ass, moving a pencil. And, and I thought, whoa, what's going on here? That is fascinating. Again, I could spend forever on this with you, but I, I think that right there is just a huge gift to us just to hear what that process was like. And I, I want to say this is, well, first of all, one thing that's really interesting to me is that there was pressure on there, deadline pressure, but that pressure can crush some people and others take that pressure and they do what you did, which is dig their heels in and they use it. Um, to create something really powerful. And that's what you did. And I just want to acknowledge you for that. The other thing I want to mention is what you're talking about, that t- from two minutes a day to, you know, breaking breaking the dam really is what you did and it started just flowing. That's, uh, that's what I call transformation. Mm-hmm. And you are modeling that what, that, what that looks like. And so I just really want to acknowledge you in, for that. And I, I want to say that's the game that we're playing in Fearless Mastery, uh, which is for anyone who's listening, that's our small group program where there's maybe 15 to 20 people in there. We all work to create some kind of transformation like Linda has. So I'd love to hear, just touch on Fearless Mastery for you and like, why, why did you come into Fearless Mastery and what do you think it's, um, what do you think you've gotten out of it? I think I came back, back to it now because uh, in this round, because mm-hmm. stuff's getting too hard with the parkies, you know, to uh, mm-hmm. the executive thinking, you know, all that it's stuff. There's so I mean, it's a degenerative illness, right? And I can't stop mm-hmm. that. I can slow it down, uh, and right. I can't do this alone. And the thing about, mm-hmm. and this is you know, with the PhD and all, uh, the thing about fearless mastery is there is a community. And it's a very small community, and that's beautiful. And there's nothing wrong with bigger ones, but it's a very small community. We're all completely different, of course. We've all got our things that right. we want to work on, but we lift each other up. Um, mm-hmm. we, we did breakout rooms yesterday uh, in, in the mastery uh, or the, the 
yeah, yesterday in mastery. And yeah. I went in uh, with three other people I've never worked with before. And yeah. it was just fascinating because we, we, we bounced off each other in a mastery way, I guess, and hearing their struggles, what they're working with, lifted me because, well, they just help. And, and there's something about mm. it. We are in that mindset all together and we, we feed off each other at a very special level, I think. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah, that's that's the kind of magic that happens in there that is hard for me to like transmit to others and let them know this is the kind of thing that happens. So you talking about your experience um, is is really helpful. So thanks for sharing that. Um, I would love to touch on the go back to uh, new voice, um, new voice and the choir. choir that you lead. New voice choir. Okay, I'm gonna. I'll get it right eventually. You gotta keep training me. <laughs> um, so new voice choir, and uh, so you are the leader of it, the con the conductor of it. Um, and you, how long have you been doing it? And I, I would love for you to also just explain the gift that it is for you and for the people who are a part of it. Um. Well, I'm not a leader. That's not what we call it. Okay. I'm the I'm the okay. musical director and and the president too. Okay. But, um, so we've got a, a full, um, very hard working management committee um, of of volunteers. Okay. Uh, so, but I'm the musical director on top of that, um, and they can't sack me. So, <laughs> um, I started that choir with somebody else who, at that time, uh, her husband has Parkinson's. They're both in our choir, um, and she was running a support or co-running a support group for Parkinson's Queensland. Uh, and so okay. she had this idea about starting a choir for the community. And I had this idea, mm. but I thought, oh, it's too hard, too hard basket because there's so much admin because I'd worked so many choirs in my teaching business. Mm. I can't do all that admin because I was prepared to work for free for the first time in my life as a musical director because this was my way of giving back to the Parkinson's community and I've never taken a cent okay. from them in that respect. Um, we started around, I think it was late 2015, we were the first one of its kind in Queensland. We've never stopped even wow. during the pandemic. Um, with we, worked at, we were one of the first choirs to go on Zoom, um, which was quite, oh, wow. quite a thing because everyone's got different bandwidths, right? So you've got to turn the choir sure. off. On to, you've got to turn them off when they're singing back at you. So I spent six months not knowing if that choir was ever singing in tune, which is quite <laughs> <laughs> quite something. Um, and uh, so hmm. one day when, when I drive home from a rehearsal, because I do a full-on two-hour rehearsal, when I drive home I tend to think about the rehearsal all the way home. You know, did that person not look very mm. well? Should I pick up the phone? You know, gee, they're going well, you know, blah, blah, blah. And I, I, oh, I wow. sort of just go through the whole rehearsal. What did, oh, I shouldn't have, I shouldn't have done that. I should have done that, that sort of stuff. Mm. And one day I was driving home, the choir had been running for a few years and I knew by then that I used to manage to lift people at a rehearsal. I didn't really know mm. why, but I figured I did. I hadn't, it was just what I did as a teacher because I've been teaching for all my adult life. And, and that particular day, it suddenly occurred to me, just, just bang, that I'd actually fallen head over heels in love with all the choir members, really oh, wow. fallen in love, and it was the most beautiful sensation. And, yeah, so mm. because we have a community, we form such a community. and That's so yeah. great. That's just just the love that you just expressed is just such a touching thing. Um, I'm I'm moved, and I could feel that this choir is an expression of your love and and theirs, I'm sure as well. But just you just pouring your love into this, falling in love with each and every one of them, and um, working f without pay and just pouring yourself into that is just an incredible expression of love. So I just really want to acknowledge you for well, that. I've also had, um, you know, I've had quite a few months away from them last year because I wasn't okay. well um, and I was trying to move mm. house and build and whatnot. And and I went back to them because we work in calendar years, you know, Southern Hemisphere. We start uh, choirs, okay. we start off at the end of January when school goes back. 
uh, after our summer break. And it was, um, so I've been back with them since we, uh, it's almost the end of term one. And it's just mm-hmm. been magic to be back. Just magic. Mm. And what I imagine that this has been a gift for everybody who's involved, not just you. Um, could you tell me a little bit about what people have been getting out of it who are a part of it or even just get to experience it as an audience member? Like, tell me just a little bit about uh, that. When we, we used to do a lot of gigs uh, because uh, I always run performance choirs, even though it's a Parkinson's sort of more therapy type choir. So we do multi, multi-part multi mm-hmm. uh, things and whatnot. We haven't done a gig since before the pandemic because you've got to appreciate we've oh, really? got a lot of, vul- lot of very vulnerable people in that choir. We have people from their 40s to their 90s um, and there's nothing is going to spread uh, COVID more than singing at them and, right. or them singing at right. me. Um, so uh, we shut down pretty quick uh, when we had to and uh, we are about to do our first gig just after I come back from London actually a couple of weeks later, um, oh, wow. the first time in, cool. in years. Now, audience members, you mentioned that. People come up to me afterwards. We did a gig once. I remember I had a lineup of people in a queue waiting to talk to me after I did this gig. Oh, wow. Just to tell me how inspired they were because they were all there because they had mm. uh, people in their family, say, with Parkinson's or friends, and just to tell me how inspired they were. I love that. I just, that That's touches magical. me so deeply that I can do that. Mm. Um and we have audience members occasionally who cry, not because we're so bad, but, mm. <laughs> but well, or they could. Um, but, uh, yeah, and the, the people. Could be a little bit of both. Could be. But the people in choir, they, everyone's different, you know. So they, mm-hmm. you, you, you watch newbies come in and at first they're all about the singing and, oh, you know, is this going to help my husband who's here too, you know, with his, with his Parkinson's. Right. But. But as the time goes on, they become part of our community. And mm. it's, um, yeah, so, and you see a whole That's different part of their, uh, uh, their attitude to the choir, if you like. It, it changes. You, you just watch these shifts because I'm at the front, I get to see it. Um, yeah, mm. it's, it's really interesting. The smiles change. You know, there's a, it's all different. I'm, I, I feel so blessed just to hear you talking about it because what you're creating there, what everyone's creating together is, is magic. People feeling like they have a place that they belong, a community, that they're not in this alone, which can be so challenging for them and family members. I, I hasten, it's just, it's just magical. I hasten to say there are other things that various community therapies that have been started up um, uh, some of them after ours. We were one of the first big mm. therapies for Brisbane. But, um, yeah, so there are other other things that people attend. But there is sure, something very sure. special about, and it's been, as I said, studied so much, singing, actually singing in a group. Mm. Yeah. Oh, and I got to say, like I said, I've, I've seen videos um, of it in action, and it is magical even watching it on video not being in person so i'm gonna i'm gonna share links um and is there anything that you want to share about you know if anyone wants to you know get involved or know more about you or just anything you want to share before we close yeah well in terms of the choir we're a registered charity that's a point um Mm. and we do have a website um which we can link to and the video is on that website um and uh Other than that, um, no, but people, if anyone is interested in, in this on the neurological side, I would welcome, absolutely welcome that uh, neuroscience side. Okay. Uh, so interesting. Yeah, I'd love people to be in touch. So if anyone wants to get in touch with Linda, you can email me and I can pass it on to them. Mm-hmm. Is that is that, or to Linda, is that Abs- okay, Linda? Absolutely. And okay. When you put this up online, you can put the choir's uh, website up with it. Yeah. Okay. And there's contact there as well. Mm. Uh, so if you are a neuroscientist and you want to like share something or, or you're interested in something or just anyone who, who wants to just share anything with Linda about this podcast and what, what she's doing, email me podcast at zenhabits.net. 
I also just love hearing from people. Um, but yeah, I can pass on anything to Linda. Um, and I want to close here. I know we've gone over our allotted time. So thank you, Linda, for spending some more time. Because this is fascinating. And I just want to say thank you. Um, it's this has my been honor. just such a beautiful conversation. <sighs> hmm. So it wasn't so scary after all. <laughs> <laughs> awesome.